This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. In March of 2013, John Houston and three other men set out to explore Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Arctic as part of their New Land 2013 expedition. With the help of four sled dogs, the team skijored over 511 nautical miles on Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg Islands. The purpose of their 65-day journey, beyond traveling through a remote and beautiful landscape, was to create a documentary film to celebrate the second Fram expedition, led by the Norwegian Arctic explorer Otto Svedrup, and to educate school children about climate change. You can learn more about their adventure at johnhuston.com. John Houston, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Good to be here. John, how did you get started in polar exploration? I've always been attracted to adventurous stories from a young age, and I found myself working at Outward Bound in Ely, Minnesota, after I graduated from college and was totally captivated by winter expedition travel. So Outward Bound has a small dog sledding cross-country ski expeditionary program in the wintertime. And I started reading about polar exploration history and was just totally enthralled with Norwegian stories, Roll Amundsen, Fridtjof Nansen, and Otto Svedrup. And these humble, kind of lesser-known explorers didn't get the big headlines because of the country they came from and because their expeditions were successful and lacked kind of the tragic drama that gets the big headlines throughout history. But I use those stories as positive inspiration and as educational curriculum and started thinking that, hey, maybe I can do these sorts of trips myself. And got a lucky break and ended up on an expedition on Greenland in the spring and summer of 2005, rerunning uh, the race to the South Pole for a huge BBC History Channel television documentary. And, yeah, just kept going since then. Being in Ely is a big part of that. Will Steger, Paul Shirky, and other people have followed their dreams and had a lot of success and made big polar trips seem doable. And that culture is a big part of Ely, and I caught the bug. How did the idea for the New Land 2013 expedition come about? The idea was my expedition co-leaders, Tobias Thorleifsen of Norway. And he had studied Svedrup for many years. And as a student in Canada, he went to Simon Fraser University outside of Van- or in Vancouver. And he noticed that in northeastern Canada, there's all these Norwegian place names. So he investigated it and found that between 1898 and 1902, Otto Svedrup and his relatively small expedition team mapped over 1,500 square kilometers of, at that point, new land or unknown land to, to uh, modern you know, Western culture. And we wanted to tell that story and, and travel through the land at the same pace that Svedrup did. And I've known about Svedrup and always wanted to travel to Ellesmere Island and worked with Toby before. And so it it was a natural fit. It's a good change of pace for me from doing these kind of polar dash expeditions where you make it to the North Pole or South Pole or else. And those are very stressful. So a trip to Ellesmere, one of the most beautiful and remote places in the Canadian Arctic where the goal is to make a documentary film and really take in and immerse ourselves in the landscape what was a welcome change. So tell me about the other team members and how the team came about. Toby and I came up with the idea to do the trip, I don't know, probably over a bottle of scotch in a Callaway in 2008. We just had a shared passion for history and telling these stories of those Norwegian explorers that were, that were a big inspiration to us. And Kyle O'Donoghue, a South African filmmaker who 
happened to live in Norway because he is engaged to a Norwegian woman, had worked with Toby in Antarctica, and so he was a natural fit. And Hugh Dale Harris, a outward-bound colleague of mine, he's Canadian, he lives in Ottawa, Ontario, and worked at a sister outward-bound school across the Canadian border from the outward-bound school where I worked. We wanted to have an international team and a Canadian with the skills that Hugh has. He's a member and co-leader of the fastest North Pole trip of all time, 37 days. And so we, we decided to take Hugh along as well. He's a photographer and very skilled on the ice. So who you select and the skills they have and how everyone gets along is one of the most important things out there. And you can't change it once you made those selections. How did you guys get along? We got along just great. Really, really well. We were all in one tent, which was intentional in planning. We went over various scenarios. We decided that one tent was by far the best for communication and team unity and and just kind of avoiding little clicks and that sort of thing that can develop. Yeah, we had a lot of humor. It was relatively low stress expedition. We had some tough decisions here and there, but yeah, we we matched well. Our personalities got along great, and, and everyone fit into the roles very well. And we had kind of a consensus-based decision-making model, uh, with, along with Toby and I making you know having the final say on some things. But but uh, yeah, went went very very well out there. John, how much preparation and both uh, time-wise, physical, goes into an expedition like this? We train for about six months ahead of time and, or more. And so that, that's a big part of the training. The, the whole preparation is that if you physically go out every day and pull tires or do core strengthening exercises several months ahead of time, and you're going to be mentally prepared as well in many ways because you have that feeling of big commitment and you get used to the pace of the travel. And all these things are very, very important so that when you hit the ice, you're more or less doing the same thing you were doing in training. It's just in a different place. And it's not as intense as the North Pole trip because we were ski touring. We had dogs, so we had some power assistance there. And... At the same time, we're older than we have been. I'm, I'm in my mid to late 30s now and a little slower to heal up or, or recover from exercise. So we didn't want to have any injuries out there. And so we take that pretty seriously. They're expensive trips and we know that we have one shot once we're on the ice of doing what we want to do. And it's, up, it's our responsibility to prepare correctly. So we take it seriously and it's, it's fun. It can be a bit boring and tiresome, but but it's it's part of it. I wanted you to talk about the amount of gear that you're taking because from going through your website, you had something like twenty some or more bags of duffel, big duffel bags full of gear in your hotel room one one time. Tell me about the stuff that you have to haul along with you. <laughs> yeah, logistics to get everything up north are is a huge puzzle of duffel bags and sorting and getting the weights to the bags to be correct. So our hotel rooms can look like a yard sale sometimes. On this expedition, we hauled about 150 pounds per person. It was a resupplied trip. So often our sled loads were lighter than that. And we wanted relatively light weights so that we would have, be able to travel good distance and not stress our bodies too much. And, and to just in, enjoy the trip and get the the film and photo material that that we set out to do, and if you haul massive loads, it can it can cut down on that margin there. We eat about a kilo or two point two to two and a half pounds of food every day per person, and that adds up, and we burn about. I don't know, 300 milliliters to 500 milliliters of fuel every day, depending on how cold it is, and that adds up. And unlike backpacking or high-altitude mountaineering, it's pretty easy to pack for a polar trip. You can just throw everything in your sled bag. But you got to be careful with that because, because everything fits relatively easily. It can be 
too easy to take extra stuff. So we weigh everything ahead of time and, and make sure it's where we need it to be. And it can be a bit stressful getting it to where it needs to be. Because once you're on the ice, it's, it's what you have in your sled and that's it. So were there any considerations because you're using dogs as well to keep the weight down uh, for them? Right. There, there's a good balance between how much, you know, you bring a dog because you want the dog to, to add some power and speed and make things easier. But if you bring too much dog food, then your sleds get too heavy and you cancel out that advantage. We just kind of tested it out and thought that one dog would be able to pull its own food and, and then some. And, and it worked out really well. And part of that was that our, our ski conditions were just totally awesome. We had very good hard packed snow or a little bit of fresh snow on top of sea ice and with not too much friction. And every day I was just amazed after skiing on the Arctic Ocean, skiing around Ellesmere Island and on the coast of Ellesmere Island, the, the ski conditions were just out of this world good. So we, we got lucky there and that contributed to our, our good rate of travel. But yeah, if you're, if let's say we brought two dogs and then you have to add more dog food and add more, a little bit more dog equipment and tie out wires then then it all adds up so we can't we try to keep it simple and, and we think we hit this sweet spot for our conditions so you guys at the start of your expedition or i should say before it even gets started you're kind of scattered throughout the globe and then you converge on ikaluit for a few days of preparation and that's where you meet your dogs mm-hmm. and um, so tell me about these dogs right i've worked with sled dogs my whole career ever since i were bound and at our bound. And it's just a fantastic thing to work with sled dogs. They add so much fun and motivation and I think a, a heightened wilderness connection to, to the experience. But at the same time, if you're going to own sled dogs, it's it's very burdensome. It's, it's an awesome thing, but it really ties you down in life and it's very hard to travel and you have to make sure those dogs are cared for and fed and trained and that that's a huge commitment um, it's like having a family that that you can't move so we decided that we wanted to rent dogs from the musher community in the which we have some connections to and we got lucky that a friend of a friend had just adopted a kid and a young kid and she had a small dog yard and didn't have the time to to uh, train her dogs or use her dogs. So we ended up getting her four best dogs for this expedition, three of which were siblings. And to be able to rent dogs and have them work out and be beautiful and powerful and but also be the, the best dogs of a dog yard is pretty fortunate. And we, we, thanked, we thanked our fortune every single day because those dogs, they loved the trip as much as we did. And they add to the travel probably 50% to 70% uh, to be able to, to ski with a 150-pound load and actually glide is an incredible feeling. And it doesn't happen too often unless you have a dog doing the right, the right sort of work. So we were a bit nervous when we met them, but as soon as we saw them, we thought, all right, we got some real dogs here, and it's, and it's going to work out. Of course, you got to develop rapport. And the dogs have to get used to us, and we have to get used to them. And that process went went pretty well. So do you try to match up your personality with the dog's personality? Well, we try to adapt our mushing style to the the style that they were raised and trained with. And the personality of each musher, or in our case, ski jar person, we try to be as consistent as possible as possible across the whole team and everyone's a little different. So the dog you spend the most time with, you'll have the strongest rapport with, and that's just kind of natural. And there's little, some dogs need a little harsher voice or a little less praise or more praise. And you just get a sense for that when you work with them. And so it's not so much the personality of the musher. It's what the dog needs. And, and, and being able to identify that and be consistent with it. 
so Toby and Hugh and I had all had very good dog experience. So it, it went well. And the, the really cool and fun thing was is that when you dog sled, you get sometimes you have eight, twelve dogs, and you get rapport with the lead dog or maybe one or two other dogs in the team. But you, you know you're responsible for all of them. But on our expedition, it was one dog and one man, and so it was a much more intimate, personal connection. And I, we really feel that both the people and the dogs really se- sense that more intimate connection. And it was really fun that way. That it was me and my dog, Ellie. And we, we were skiing every day together. And, and we felt that camaraderie in a, in, a, in a fantastic way. So it was really kind of a special, unique way of working with dogs that we felt was very successful. John, let's get into the, the journey itself. Kind of. <clears throat> we can talk about sort of the highlights along the way. So you're after a Callowit, you spend some time in resolute doing some further preparations and then take it from resolute. Yeah. Out of resolute, we charter an airplane, the Havilland twin otter and we fly about, it took us about an hour in the air, uh, a few hundred miles North to goose fjord on the southwestern corner of Ellesmere Island. Goose Fjord is a long, finger-like fjord. Ellesmere has a lot of fjords like that, where Otto Svedrup and his team parked their ship, the Fram, the famous Norwegian polar vessel, for two years, unintentionally. They wanted to be there for one year, and they, the ice didn't melt after the first year, so they were stuck. They, they made a mistake and sailed the boat too far north into the fjord and open water didn't reach them so that was their base for two years and yeah we were a bit unprepared for the wind and cold getting off the plane because it had been warm in a Callaway resolute unseasonably so and we had 20 knots plus of wind right out the plane and kyle our cameraman got a little frostbite in his nose in the first 10 seconds so that was a wake-up call a little funny Nothing, not a big deal, but just like, okay, we're on the ice now. But it was also, it was a shock to, to see that Svedrup lived in this kind of wind funnel for two years. And the land kind of pushes the, the wind to come come through from the north. Yeah, and from there, which is the west coast of Ellesmere Island, we basically traversed or traveled the entire west coast of Ellesmere Island with a few overland sections following Svedrup's historic portions of Svedrup's historic routes. And, yeah, cold temperatures in the beginning, minus 35, and some wind, which can be darn cold. And then warmed up uh, with the increasing sunlight pretty quickly to lots of, yeah, minus 20 Fahrenheit to plus 10, and then much, much warmer toward the end of the trip. And, yeah, right right at the gate, we were able to average almost two nautical miles per hour of travel, which is, which is a very good pace for a polar expedition, including time for f- filming and, and photographs and, and breaks. Yeah, we saw signs of Sudrup ex- Sudrup's expedition on the first day. We thought we would. We, we had heard from people who had sailed into Goose Fjord that there were some navigational markers that might be covered by the snow. But uh, we came upon a cairn or two that uh, in the first few hours just walking around the, the hillsides that we, we felt were very likely used by Svedrup as navigational kind of cairns or devices. And what's the next milestone that you hit? The goal was a place called Troll Fjord, which we hit the mouth of about two weeks later. Troll Fjord back in Svedrup's day was part of an uh, unsolved puzzle. And the northern half of Ellesmere Island w- was more or less known. And through Svedrup's work and work from the Greeley expedition and a, another American expedition. So Svedrup was, Svedrup was trying to link the, the bottom half of Ellesmere Island toward the northern half. And they didn't know if how Ellesmere was an island or if there were other islands involved 
And so they kept trying these long fjords to, to connect the north to the south. And after a few failed attempts, they ended up in Troll Fjord, which turns out to be a pretty good route to the northern half of Ellesmere Island, but, but not the, the ideal route, but it, it was passable. And with only guides we were using were, were today's maps and Svedrup's actual journal and his book about his expedition. So we were really in Svedrup's world. And, yeah, they picked a really good route. And, and Trollfjord is kind of this, this kind of a gate into true the true heart of wild Ellesmere because it's rarely, rarely traveled. And... It feels like you're in, I guess, a truly wild realm that time has forgotten in some ways. So we saw some Arctic wolves there. We saw a few muskox. At one point, while skiing on the sea ice, we came across something on the horizon that was moving. We're like, what is that? It looks like an Arctic fox. And we get closer, and it's an Arctic fox that's in the process of finishing off a baby seal killing it and to be able to film that and, and come across something like that is, is extraordinarily rare and just is like wow we're really in a wild, the wild arctic now let alone it just being spectacularly beautiful with steep cliff walled fjord lines and, and kind of a highland area when we went over land that that was a beautiful watershed with peaks in the distance and, and kind of a height of land feel, a big open basin. So, yeah, that, that, that was the, the midpoint or kind of the R, kind of unknown. How, how are we going to travel through this unknown place that Svedrup traveled through? And where was the fi- your final destination before you turned around? Yeah, we stopped at Eureka Weather Station on the way north to resupply. And then we continued north through Nansen Sound all the way to a place called Lands Lock, which is the far northwestern corner of Ellesmere. And that was Svedrup's furthest north as well in 1902. And our, our goal was to get there and to spend a few days there and, and walk around and ski around the landscape looking for a mysterious lost cairn that Svedrup had supposedly built in 1902 that has never been located. So we thought it was just kind of a fun goose chase. You know, the living history of Ellesmere is kind of like that. So few people have traveled there that you can run up against your hero's kind of landmarks and feel like that very few people have been there since. And so we wanted to see if we had a chance of finding Svedrup's cairn and we did find a cairn on almost the exact coordinates that Svedrup said he had built a cairn in 1902. And after looking into it further and talking with a group of explorers who had gone there in the 90s, I believe, we learned that the, Sved- that the cairn had been attributed to the American explorer Robert Peary, uh, and that in the 50s, a British geology party had found the cairn originally, and inside had found a note from from Robert Peary, uh, dated 1906. The only true evidence of that cairn is that it's 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 attributed to Peary, even though it's on the exact location that Frederick said he built a cairn in 1902. So we turned around there and then headed back south to Eureka, uh, along the west coast of Axel Heiberg and into the increasing warm temperatures of spring, which is still kind of chilly because you get cold skiing and develop, get sweaty. But it's nice to have some warmth, and we ended up traveling at a nighttime to, to have a bit cooler weather for ourselves and our dogs, and that gives the opportunity to ski south and with the northern sun above the horizon in the 24 hour sunlight and you get this spectacular midnight kind of alpen glow that lasts for hours uh and that was just a fantastic way to kind of finish off our our gorgeous ski trip you mentioned wildlife do you have to worry about um any predators up there for yourselves um wolves polar bears so on 
definitely we're not at the top of the food chain and that that's a humbling feeling and, and the biggest predator that we have to worry about is the polar bear and we were lucky only to see two both at a quite a distance about 200 yards out from camp and never got closer than that one of the reasons we bring dogs is for wildlife alarms but we are also pretty wary of, of arctic wolves we saw 65 maybe more arctic wolves individual arctic wolves over the course of the 65 day trip and they're very curious about our dogs we had hoped our dogs would be more vociferous in their alarm capabilities but they were more kind of shy about it when dogs when wolves came around and just maybe made some yips or a few squeaks but not not outright barking so we had to keep a pretty keen ear during the nighttime for possible wolves coming close to camp and and they did come close sometimes they came within 20 yards during the night or during during the evening or morning so to be able to film and photograph wolves from that from that close was, was really cool but also got kind of commonplace, I and mean, we saw wolves so often that it got to the point where, like, do we have to film these wolves today? Can we just ski and enjoy it? Uh, at one point, I guess, at, when we were at the Eureka Weather Station, our tent pitched about 200 yards outside of town of 10 people who worked there year-round. We had taken the dogs up to the base so that the people on duty could, could meet the dogs. And that was a mistake because 11 wolves descended upon our camp, which was unattended. And one of them ended up stealing my lunch bag <laughs> and running off to the horizon with a few sticks of butter and some deep fried bacon and some fudge bars. Uh, so we yeah, got all that on video. It's hilarious. We have this YouTube video of it right now and, to see Toby running after the wolf and chasing my lunch bag down because we didn't know exactly what it was. We thought it might be the film cards at first because they were stored in the same color bag that my lunch bag was. So it all worked out in the end, but it was a mistake on our part to leave our camp unattended. But uh, I ended up getting the lunch bag back actually because one of the friends who works at the Eureka Weather Station was out for a walk and they saw it lying in the the newly melted snow a few months later and they mailed it to me as a surprise. Best piece of mail I ever got. It's pretty funny. Just totally shredded and chewed up. But I got my lunch bag back. <laughs> now, during part of your journey, you guys make a decision to start traveling at night. Why was that? It happens on most polar trips that at some point when you get advanced into uh, the warmer temperatures, it's best to travel at night, especially when you're traveling with dogs. Dogs don't function that well in the warmer temperatures. They can overheat. And even though it's like only 15 or 20 degrees out, you get a lot of reflection off the snow. And, and that can feel very warm during the daytime. So it's much more comfortable to travel at night when the sun is lower in the horizon. It's still 24-hour sunlight, but the sun is lower in the horizon at nighttime, so it's cooler. It's, it's a tough switch. It's, you get some jet lag when you, when you switch over to traveling at night, but you get the benefit of cooler temperatures and this, this surreal beauty of traveling in the polar night, which is low-light conditions with long shadows and just gorgeous, soft light lighting up ice chunks and mountains in the horizon. And it, it's a really, really cool, calm feeling to be traveling at night. And the photographs and, and views that we have are some of the best of the trip. So it was great to be able to do that and not be stressed about. I mean, we were, we were uh, ahead of schedule most of the time. So not having route, route stress is something that that is rare to experience on a polar trip and and we felt fortunate what was the most challenging part of the expedition i think the most challenging i mean this trip wasn't like as physically challenging as skiing to the north pole or something like that it was more of a trip where we, we wanted to tell the story right and get all the right film shots and, and photographs and, and things like that. So 
I think to be to know that we were doing that was one of the major challenges, and to know that we were getting what we needed to get, and and have it feel real and not contrived, and because we didn't want to act, and we don't we wanted to have a human product we didn't want it to we want, and in the moment we didn't want to rehearse anything and, and have, have that be the film so being able to to be comfortable in front of the camera and and real like that took a little, a little bit of transition but we felt we did a good job with it so that was that was i guess one challenge i mean it's funny i've done a lot of these trips but it's always a daily challenge to not freeze your ass off on breaks. You're skiing and you get a little sweat going and you stop for 10 or 15 minutes to, to eat and drink some water every 90 minutes or two hours. And those breaks, even in the warmer temperatures, depending on how much sweat you built up, can be just absolutely frigid because all that sweat starts to freeze and cool you down. And yeah, that's not fun. You get, you get to a sweet spot when it's not super warm but not super cold where, where you can you get in a groove with it. But sometimes when it's warmer, you're, you're sweating more than you are when it's cold out. And you're actually colder on breaks than you would be in colder temperatures. So that's a, that's a daily battle and always a challenge, uh, especially when you're filming because you stand around when, when the film's rolling sometimes. John, what was the biggest takeaway for you from this expedition? There's always great takeaways and trips, and I don't know. I think two things come to mind off, off this trip is that it's so fantastic to go to an extraordinarily remote place like Ellesmere Island and not have it be a pedal to the metal race, and where you can go out and, and you can enjoy yourself and get the film and get the photos and tell the story and travel the distance you need to travel and have all that happen if i can do that again in my career i'll I'll be really really happy because it's it's great to go to the antarctic and to the arctic ocean and race to the pole but it's not always fun and you don't always get the best photo and video because you're you're focused on making the trip happen you know successful you have to make it and to have our model work and then I guess the second thing, work with dogs, which added so much to a trip and make the personal human dynamics much lighter because it's not so human centric of a mental thing. There's dogs to play with and joke around with and talk about and sing to and all that. And let alone like they are so wonderful in photos and, and part of the storytelling and add like historical connection to, to the feel of the trip. Uh, that that was a really special thing, and I, I love to work with dogs again in a similar way, or have have them on a trip because you know the original historic explorers traveled with dogs, and it was part of the dynamic. And to be able to do that today and travel at the same pace and kind of similar mode to our historic heroes was was fun and and, and a very nice t- traditional feel of experience. Uh, so I think those are the two big takeaways. Is is uh, do a trip that is, is a successful tour and managed right and not stressful and then and, and ha- have dogs be a part of it. On your website, you mentioned the Chicago Voyagers. Tell me about them. Chicago Voyagers are a growing nonprofit in Chicago. It's a youth at risk mentorship program that takes youth teenagers from in Chicago on, on wilderness excursions and they otherwise would not have the opportunity to do that. It sets them up with mentors to, to help them stay in school, make positive choices and, and empower them to be successful meeting their challenges. And it takes, I think this past summer or past year, over 600 kids uh, out, out into the woods and sets them up with mentors and role models. And I do everything I can to help them out whether that's fundraising or being out with them from time to time. Uh, it's a fantastic organization. So the film, I think reading your website, the film had its debut in Norway, but what about the U.S.? 
Yeah, actually, the film debuts on TV in Norway today, December 30th. And we had a kind of a premiere event uh, a few weeks ago in Norway on the 17th of December. Right now, we don't have a scheduled debut in North America. And we are in talks with different outlets for television distribution. And we'll also pursue a festival film. So that's that's where that is right now. So it, we're early in that process. The, the Norwegian version was the priority and the one we had a commitment from before the expedition started. And and uh, we're in the early part of the North American process. But we feel yeah, we'll have a festival film uh, in the least and hope, hopefully something on TV in the next year or so. John, what's next for you? Yeah, next for me, I do a lot of motivational speaking for companies and other organizations. So my schedule is pretty busy with that this next few months here. I'll be over in Norway at a wilderness festival in mid-February at Finsa, which is like a this mini version of Antarctica uh, near the Hardanger Veda Plateau in February. So that'll be a lot of fun. I'll be in Ely, Minnesota in a few days here instructing our bound course for a week so that that'll be good stuff get back out in the cold and yeah still working on post expedition uh work from this expedition on in the state side as well so besides that i, I work with bergens in norway outdoor clothing and equipment company they just have a new operation in in the states in north america they've made technical uh, equipment and clothing since 1908 and have outfit the original Polar Explorers. So I helped them with gear design and promotion. So I, I keep busy on various projects. And as far as expeditions, uh, we don't have anything announced right now, but we have some ideas. Uh, so we'll let this one settle and then not rush into the next one, but sometime in the next few years, I'll be back on the ice in some way or other. How can people contact you? Yeah, you can find me at my website, johnhouston.com or newland2013.com. Okay, John Houston, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it, and uh, good luck with your future endeavors. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Recorded December 30th, 2013. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.